Welcome, everybody, to this afternoon's fast pitch session. The topic that we have here for the afternoon is the ocean. And I wanted to remind you still, and I had hoped that the slides would still be up. We very much look forward to your questions after the fast pitches are over. And the way that you place your question is to text the number that you hopefully will be seeing there and make sure that you leave a space between the ID and your actual text. And please, please, please limit it to 160 characters. Questions that are only halfway there are very difficult to answer. So with that, I think I'm the first one that is supposed to start. And let's switch. So, good afternoon. My name is Mark von Keitz. I'm a program director at RPE, and I'm here today to talk to you about backs to the future. And we have heard a lot about carbon negative technology already, and I am going to talk to you about an approach that has emerged from two separate programs that are coming together and I think really bring some very exciting opportunities. We have heard a lot about carbon negative technology and it's really driven by the need in order to stay at two degrees, we have to reach net zero in about 50 years. And even if we work very, very hard in order to get down the carbon emissions, there's always going to be a certain amount of fossil uh, CO2 still coming out of the system at that point. And in order to make up for that, we will need negative emissions technology. And negative emissions technology is ultimately all about scale. And that's what we have to think about. We, in probably 30 years, have to be at several gigatons. In 50 years, we have to be in the range of tens of gigatons. And this morning, we heard one gigaton is bigger than the total weight of the population on Earth. So these are big numbers. And there's a range of negative emissions technologies that are currently being researched and explored and developed. And the one that you hear a lot about is really BECS. This is, BECS stands for bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. And in its most traditional form, it relies on a supply of biomass, typically woody biomass that is coal fired in coal power plants, and then the exhaust carbon is captured and stored underground. There's been a number of stories. If you really look at a lot of the scenarios, this is a technology that is oftentimes put forward. But the problem with this is that we are definitely facing a limitation in feedstock supply. Oftentimes it's land or water or both. Sometimes it's also just getting the material to a power plant. And then the other part that's always a problem is we still have to put the CO2 in the right geology that we can lock it off for long enough periods of time. And the final factor is that there's a little bit of a trend going on that coal seems to be phased out. And so we are not having, if we at the same time want to scale this to a large scale, there's a we would need to build more solid fuel power plants. And so this is really a tension that exists there that we need to address. So with that in mind, I just wanted to recapitulate with you. If we want to gigaton scaling, the very first thing we clearly need, the process just has to be technically scalable. But that's not enough. So that's, that's the first condition, but that's not enough. And so, we also have to have the feedstock supply. I mentioned that. And we don't want to compromise food and feed when we do that. But then it's really speed to scale. So as I mentioned, we have to be in the multiple gigatons range in 30 years. And a critical factor in order to reach that is to mobilize a lot of capital. And in order to do that, you have to have this technology ultimately financeable. You have to minimize the risks that the technology that you are putting into the ground becomes stranded assets. And so what I want to talk to you about today is a different approach to BECS that starts 
with methane. It's fueled by methane, very simple molecule. And as you know, we have a lot of it. So, but there is a great way of dealing with the methane is through a process called methane pyrolysis that allows you to break it apart into hydrogen, which then becomes a CO2-free energy source, and at the same time you get solid carbon. Solid carbon is much easier to store away than CO2, but where it becomes actually exciting, and that's with a number of projects that we are currently supporting at RPE, we don't just want to store it, we want to make something useful with it. And so there's really some big efforts to make meaningful material like carbon fiber that can be used in cars or buildings. So we have to match it with markets that are big enough that we can really put the, this to use on a very large scale. So this is the first step. This allows us to decarbonize a very critical energy source, natural gas. And it allows us to do that in a way that we really build large enough infrastructure but then where it really becomes interesting, methane is a molecule. And while it mostly comes from fossil sources right now, there are other sources. And so by switching to renewable methane, we can go from carbon neutral to carbon negative. And we have significant sources for that. The process is called anaerobic digestion. The feedstock that is currently available is animal manure, wastewater treatment sludge, a lot of food waste, and we can then produce significant quantities of methane, but we still produce CO2, but there is a new technology approach called power to gas that allows us to actually take renewable electricity, take that CO2, and also bring it into the methane stream, thereby allowing us to basically get 100% carbon conversion or close to it. And so, but as I said, the feedstocks that we have are still not quite enough. And so what we really need is another source that's truly scalable. And this is where seaweed comes in. And you can see the Mariner program, which is all about no land, no fresh water, no fertilizer, and allowing us to scale a biomass source that is ideally suited for anaerobic digestion to make very, very large quantities available that is truly reaching into the gigaton scale. Because what we have there is that one gigaton is roughly equivalent, so in order to capture one gigaton, we need an area the size of the state of Colorado, roughly. And in US national waters, we can fit many, many Colorados. I think we have about 40 Colorados. I have to do my math again. But there's really a large number. So there's a lot of potential to scale this technology. So with that in mind, what, I wanted, what I'm having here is not just technologies, but it's really a path forward that allows you to avoid what we call the chicken and egg problem. Because when you have multiple technologies you, that you feed together, oftentimes there's an interdependency that makes it much harder to deploy. But what we are able to do is that we actually are leveraging US gas infrastructure and can rapidly develop methane pyrolysis because we have a security of supply of natural gas that allows us to really build an infrastructure that can scale to a very large uh, level and that engages some of the big players, the oil and gas company, in. The, the country. At the same time, once we have this scaled, we, at the same time in parallel, what we are able to do is that we can expand biogas production and also macroalgae or seaweed production that can ultimately feed into that. And both of these processes are able to work independently because each of them by themselves is already making a significant contribution. But if we get them ultimately together, we have the opportunity to enter into an area of very, very large scale carbon negative energy production. And so for hydrogen and on top of that, hopefully very valuable materials. And with that, 
I would like to invite you to talk to us about how you might want to be able to participate in that. And you can talk to me tomorrow morning or send me an email or afterwards talk here. With that, thank you very much. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Mario Garcia Sanz. I am a program director at RPAE, and I would like to talk to you today seriously about lunar energy. <laughs> so before we start, uh, I would like also, you know, to, to look at uh, some um, historical moment that is uh, uh, related to Nikola Tesla. So actually today is uh, July 9th, so it's uh, Nikola Tesla's birthday. And we are also very close to Colorado Springs, where you know, Nikola Tesla conducted very important experiments, as you can see in this uh, very popular uh, picture there. And the main idea, you know, uh, the main motivation of Nikola Tesla was, as you know, you know to harness the energies of nature you know, for the service of humanity. So I would like you know, to take you know, this idea of Nik Nikola Tesla this special day today you know, to actually ask a question, a fundamental question, that we have to be very honest about that, you know, that is, which is the ideal energy uh, of nature that, uh, or a ideal source of energy, you know, that uh, uh, we can use, you know, to produce energy in, in a very large scale. And thinking, you know, about this fundamental question, um, I have, you know, some, uh, like a pyramid of, of ideas, you know, that I would like to review very quickly with you. First of all, this ideal source of energy should be something that is definitely unlimited. Uh, let's say we have unlimited resources. It should be technically achievable, economically attractive. Uh, let's think in the LCOE cost of energy, something that is economically attractive from this point of view precise in terms of generation, so we can predict when we are going to have that energy, um, and uh, environmentally friendly, of course. Long-term survi survivability is also a very important thing, especially, you know, with these, um, you know, storms and all these kind of things that happens, you know, and, and so frequently. And finally, something that opens a new space for business, for small business, large, cor large corporations, you know, to to work in a, in a new area. Well, I have a hypothesis or a, you know, just an idea for that that is tidal energy. So if you look about you know, answers to these questions, it's definitely something that is enormous. It's, it's, it's larger actually than described in publications, uh, the amount of, of resources that we have. It's technically achievable because it's kind of the intersection between wind energy and marine engineering, you know. It's very precise. It's like a clock. I can tell you the tidal that we are going to have in 20 years' time, you know, in any place in the world. You know, it's just you, with some studies and, and looking at the moon, looking at the sun, the topology, etc. you can actually predict very, very well the amount of energy that you are going to produce any time. Um, it's in the water, it's environmentally friendly, um, it's protected because it's at the seabed, so it's really, you know, we, we can have a long-term survivability with no risk of very aggressive weather conditions, and definitely is something that can create a new space. So still we have an issue that this is still expensive, you know, so uh, from the uh, cost of energy point of view, it's something that is not still here, you know, it's, it's, it's still very expensive. But this is something that I would like to discuss with you over the next slides. So there are some current attempts, you know, and, and you can see here in the screen, you know, some of the very interesting solutions, you know, even some of them are our current performers, like, uh, ORPC, that is there in the river, you know, so, um, so we, we have, you know, very uh, good uh, technologies out there, but they're still very expensive. So we are working in that. Now, um, about a year ago, we proposed at RPAE a new metric space. It's a new way to understand technologies and also to see the 
techno-economic you know, uh, possibilities of a given system. We apply this you know, to wind, can be applied to other systems as well. So you, you can see in the screen you know, this, uh, this plot. We have actually three main components here. In the horizontal axis, you can see uh, the metric M1, that is the efficiency of the system from the air to electrons, so just efficiency. In the vertical axis, you can see the so-called M2 metric, that is the swept area of the system over the equivalent mass. The equivalent mass is something very interesting, interesting that includes not only the mass of the components, but also the materials and uh, you know, some factors related to the installation and the manufacturing. When we put these two things together, uh, you can see a LCOE constant curves, as you can see in the, in the plot, so the idea is to be north of that plot. So what we, you have here in the slide is actually the analysis that we uh, did for Atlantis. Atlantis is a program that we just released at ARPAE for floating offshore wind turbines. So the idea is that we are at about 13 cents of dollar per kilowatt hour. So you, you can see the point, the red point. This is the position today with the current technology. And what we are trying to do is to be north of this curve. Now, to do that, it's very clear that if we change efficiency, we are going to do nothing. So we, we have actually to increase M2, which means in this particular problem that we have to reduce the equivalent mass of the system. Now, if you apply this to tidal energy, you can see here in the, in the new screen um, that we are still very far away. You know, so, so the point, the red point is very low. Uh, we are talking about uh, 19, 20 cents per kilowatt hour. We, if we like to be above the six cents per kilowatt hour, that is the, the uh, green area that you can see in the screen, uh, is still a long way. So a, a couple of things that we can do uh, is to, as you can see also in the screen, to improve efficiency. We improve efficiency by, by 30%. We reduce the equivalent mass by, you know, uh, one third, uh, very close to one third. We are still very far away, you know, from the six cents uh, of kilowatt hour, as you can see there. You know, so we have to do something else, and it's actually, if you look at the LCOE uh, front, uh, if you, uh, is a function of the operational maintenance as well. So if we reduce the operational maintenance by 30 percent as well. Uh, sorry, by the one third, so multiply by, by 0.3 or point, very close to 0.4, then you see that this uh, green area goes down and then everything matches and then we can have a system that is a tidal energy converter with six cents per kilowatt hour. So, so you know, with this metric space, uh, it's easy to understand the tasks that uh, should be done, you know, and, uh, and it's a good idea for guidance, you know, with the, with, for the new technology. So in summary, we have these three things. We have uh, operational expenditures uh, reduction, you know, by like one third, uh, equivalent mass reduction, close to one third, and efficiency improvement a little bit, you know, with like uh, 1.3. Now, um, this, putting this together, what I would like to propose here is a potential new RPI program. An RPI program that can be about tidal energy converters, uh, also riverine turbines, you know, so hydrokinetic systems. Uh, something that we have to use concepts like control co-design, for instance, that uh, this is for another discussion, but it's something that we introduce also in the Atlantis uh, program. Um, and of course, you know, ideas like designing for installation, designing for operation and maintenance. So we have to think about tidal and riverine systems in another way in order to achieve, you know, this operation and maintenance reduction, equivalent mass reduction, and efficiency improvement. And, and this program can be, you know, with areas like new designs, very, you know, drastically new designs, also new computer tools, you know, for the calculations, the dynamic calculations of the systems, and experiments with real data, you know, to actually have better computer tools and to prove the concepts. And, and 
aspects like fault tolerance, like self-installation, like predictive maintenance, like control are key you know, in this new potential program. So we already have a request for information in the street. So um, the deadline, you know, to send us information or your, your comments, your ideas, you know, for that, the deadline is July 19th. So still we have, you know, uh, some good days for that. And so, and I, I will be also here, you know, to be with you um, with discussions, you know, for that. And I would like, you know, to finish with uh, a very nice picture of Nikola Tesla in this space that I think was one of the best uh, most important engineering um, systems ever that was Ni Ni Niagara Fall, also, you know, a hydrokinetic system. So thank you very much. You have there my email, you know, for any comment. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, I think I guess. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lakshana Hadar, and I'm a fellow at ARPA E. Today, I'd like to talk about how minerals <clears throat> on the deep ocean floor could potentially hold the solution to the, our supply chain issues that will arise when clean energy technologies scale up. Let me start off by asking a simple question. Here we have three pictures. The first is of a plug-in electric vehicle. The second is of a substation for energy storage powered by batteries. And the third is of a five megawatt wind turbine. What do these three technologies have in common? Some answers that may have popped into your head directly are that they all contribute to reduced emissions and that their adoption is rapidly accelerating. And it has to if we are going to move to a, an emissions-free future. But did you also know that they all require the use of critical minerals such as cobalt, nickel, and rare earth elements in order to be manufactured? The acquisition of these elements will be the focus of my presentation today. Let's take a look at where the US gets the, its critical minerals from. We import 100% of our cobalt and about 60% of our nickel. And the nickel that we do have domestically is of low grade. Of course, we should think about recycling what we currently have. For example, by extracting critical minerals from waste batteries. But in the scenario in which every person in this room and in the country replaces their personal vehicle with a plug-in electric vehicle, we would need about 1,000 times more cobalt than is currently available to be recycled. And that's not to mention the cobalt we would need for other technologies, such as grid-scale energy storage. So in short, we need large amounts of stably sourced minerals. So why don't we think outside the box a little bit and take a deep dive? This is the clarion Clipperton Fracture Zone in the Pacific Ocean. It may seem like an area in the middle of nowhere, but if you go to Google Maps, someone has kindly left us a Google review. He says, it totally sucks here. There's literally nothing to do. No atmosphere, nothing, zilch. Well, sir, I would very much beg to differ because I'm pretty sure there is still an atmosphere there. But more importantly, about five kilometers deep in the clarion Clipperton Fracture Zone, there are billions of polymetallic nodules that are just strewn on the surface. And these may hold the key to scaling up clean energy technologies. Let's take a closer look at one of these polymetallic nodules. Each one is about the size of a potato and contains mostly iron and manganese, but has a large amount of useful um, critical minerals such as cobalt and copper. If we zoom out a little bit, the clarion clipperton fracture zone is a very large area about the size of Europe. It contains billions of these nodules that are unattached to the seabed. Um, and it's estimated that there's about two and a half times the amount of cobalt in this area compared to terrestrial reserves. And the yttrium reserves are estimated to be about 6,000 times more than what exists in terrestrial reserves. So why hasn't anyone attempted a full-on deep sea mining operation yet? Well, some exploratory work has been done, but there's still a lot of technical barriers that need to be overcome in order to uh, make this technology more economical. The ocean is a harsh environment, and most of it is unknown. Less than 10% of the ocean floor has been mapped, and the deep ocean is cold with high pressures and subject to large temperature swings. The salt water can also wreak havoc on machinery that's down there for long periods of time. So we need to focus on three technical areas. Yeah. The first is on non-intrusive, ecosystem-stabilizing deep-sea mining techniques. The second is in machinery that can operate for these long durations for a mining operation. 
And the third is in novel sensors and imaging techniques that can work in these harsh environments that support deep sea mining missions. It was initially believed that there was no life in the deep ocean, but we now know that that's not true. Newly discovered species have been um, found in the abyssal plains, such as the Hawaiian Casper octopus that lays eggs on polymetallic nodules. We know that sediment that is created during these deep sea mining operations can have a detrimental effect to the fragile ecosystem here. It's estimated that with every ton of polymetallic nodules that's mined, up to five tons of sediment can be resuspended if not for some novel technology. Additionally, anthropogenic light, noise, and vibration due to deep sea mining can disturb the sea life. So can we think about designing silent machinery or sensors that operate in the dark? To me, the ecological design constraints are the most important and the most interesting when it comes to designing new machinery for deep sea mining. So a deep sea mining operation is a pretty complex system and requires many parts that need innovation. And today I'd like to focus a little bit on the collector. The collector needs to be designed such that it can collect enough polymetallic nodules for the mining operation to be profitable. We can think about vacuum-based collectors given that the nodules are unattached to the seabed and can be simply scooped up. As I mentioned, we need to reduce the amount of sediment plumes that arise. So one way of doing that is to minimize contact between the collector and the seafloor. We can also think about separating the minerals from the waste sediment close to the seafloor, as this not only reduces the sediment plumes that arise, but also it makes the mining operations more economical given that we're only sending the critical minerals up to the ship. Another interesting point to note is that the waste water that is produced during these mining operations contain a lot of nutrients. And so if we can discharge this close to the surface of the ocean, uh, we can incite more phytoplankton growth, with further, which further strengthens the ecosystem. Another crucial aspect of resource exploration in mining is underwater sensors. We need a better picture of the geographical distribution of the resource, as well as what each polymetallic nodule is made up of. So we need to think about Remote, we need to think about um, energy harvesting vehicles or uh, rechargeable underwater vehicles that can operate for long periods of time. We can also think about using existing subsea techniques, for example, from the offshore oil and gas industry, but modify them for deeper depths. So here are some examples of prototypes for collector designs that other countries have been thinking of. Uh, here we have the Belgian design, the Canadian design, and also the Australian design. As you can see, most of these designs are essentially terrestrial mining trucks that have been modified for the deep ocean. I would like to challenge you all to completely rethink the design from the ground up, given the environmental, ecological, and economical design constraints. And on that note, where's the American design? So in conclusion, uh, we need reliable access to critical minerals to keep up with growth in clean energy technologies and achieve energy and resource independence in the United States. But there's a lot of technical work that still needs to be done in order to achieve this. And as the demand for critical minerals grows and as the technology gets cheaper, deep sea mining may be inevitable. So why don't we try to make the US a leader in this space? So please, I would bring me all your great ideas. I would love to chat with you. Um, I'll be at office hours uh, tomorrow at 8 a.m. outside the Adams Ballroom. Um, I'm also available by email. Um, and thank you all very much for your attention. And please enjoy the rest of the summit. Before we start the next presentation, I just wanted to remind everybody to text your questions to the system. I think we're going to have the number out here one more time. So limit yourself to 160 characters, but keep the questions coming. Thank you. I get six minutes? You only got six. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all for coming. My name is Joseph King, and um, I'm going to talk about a period of incredible innovation. Uh, followed by a massive global unintended consequence it led to, and then talk about the huge untapped energy opportunity it now presents. That opportunity is the one quad of energy we throw away annually in the form of 
plastics packaging, and uh, container waste. Of the 78 million metric tons of packaging produced each year, 15 million is plastic. Of that plastic material, 9% gets recycled, 12% gets incinerated, the rest gets landfilled, bearing roughly one quad of energy each year. If you look at the evolution of the plastics industry and its growth, one of the things you note is there wasn't much activity prior to 1950s into the early 1960s. And even though most of this packaging material was developed and discovered in the late 19th century into the early 20th century, there were no large-scale <coughs> commercial production facilities available prior to the 1950s. These all pretty much came online. These are all initial plants. I don't have any of the follow-on plants or competitive entries. Um, what is interesting is that 8% of all petroleum is used for making plastics. And this grew unabated from the 70s, independent of any major economic or raw, raw material source issues that were happening in the globe. Now, these materials were considered to make our life easier. In fact, Life magazine ran uh, a celebration of the throwaway society. Um, and some of us got a little too good at this. <clears throat> One of the other innovations that were making our life easier is the sack of the future, the t-shirt sack that was developed back in 77. This was stronger than paper, easier to carry, and moisture proof. And today, Americans go through roughly 380 billion of these sacks annually. That means that's more than three per day per individual living in the United States. Now, it had a number of other advantages being plastics material, and that was economic as well as performance. If you tried to replace plastics packaging with any other type of equivalent material, what you would find is cost you almost five times as much, mainly due to increased manufacturing costs and the heavier weight in transportation. One of the things that is interesting, though, and is one of the points of this talk, is that the use life is extremely short for packaging relative to other areas that plastics go into. On average, um, these materials are less than six months, sometimes profoundly less than six months. So, um, excuse me, got to go back. For example, if we use the sack of the future as an example, what you find out that its average use life is extremely short. If you go from when you bag your groceries, carry it to your car, drive home, take it into the house, empty it and throw it away, on average, that use life is 20 minutes or less. Do we really need to construct materials that go into landfills and the marine environment that last 400 to 600 years where the use life is only 20 minutes? So it doesn't really matter where you live in the United States. You could be West Coast, East Coast, Heartland or Gulf, plastics, debris from packaging persists everywhere. Now, even though the long-term effects on human health have not been determined, it can have a profound effect on marine life. We did this. But I also believe in our heart of hearts we can fix this. Other groups started working to understand litter, litter as well. The Keep America Beautiful group, a collection of manufacturers and distributors, started in the 1950s mainly to get rid of glass bottle litter that was thrown around the countryside. That morphed into the Ad Council in the 60s as plastics litter started to proliferate. They did not, they weren't as effective as they wish they were. 
One of the great swirling ocean convex, um, convergencies called a gyra was discovered in 1997 off the coast of Oregon. There are five of these in all the major oceans, and they are substantially larger than the state of Texas, each one. So, for reference, Earth Day was back in 1970. Um, but for me, my first real ray of hope started in 1980. And that's because prior to 1980, all plastics packaging waste was landfilled. From 1980 on, people started to realize that incineration and recycle were much better solutions to dealing with this problem. And in fact, one of the reasons they did that is they realized that 80% of all marine plastics pollution was coming from the land. A lot of that due to site mismanagement, erosion, and what they call leakage. Now recycle is also interesting. Recycle means the mass you pick up at the curb only. Almost immediately, 25% of that is discarded due to contamination, usually landfilled. Another 10 to 25% is, uh, can't be processed properly, has the wrong composition, or is also lost due to leakage. So, are there opportunities for improvement relative to landfill? One is plastics to fuel. Uh, not an old idea, but what you notice is the main plastics that are used in packaging actually have the same energy content as gasoline or jet fuel. But if you're going dinosaurs to petroleum to plastics to fuel, uh, that's kind of the linear con economy approach. Great for recapturing that embodied energy, but not so good on greenhouse gas reduction. Another form is plastics to oil, where you take the plastics, crack it back to some value-added uh, materials, and then compete head-to-head -head with a petroleum process that does the same thing. This is much better at greenhouse gas reduction but it's less efficient in terms of total energy recapture. So, the opportunity is huge. One quad of energy per annum and growing. So what are some of the things we might do? Design for sustainability. Start with sustainable raws to make your material, and then if you want to use it as fuel or have it be biodegradable, you're much closer to that circular economy philosophy. The next is design for recyclability. Virtually no large manufacturing plant can deal with anything other than first grade or virgin feedstocks. So can we design something that is a lot more tolerant or forgiving or build follow-on plants that can reconvert to plastics? Um, this is a major engineering challenge. Third, can we design for secondary conversion. In Scotland, they're making some roads out of waste plastics. If you think about what asphalt is, it's 95% rock aggregate and 5% tar. So they could use the waste plastic in place of tar. These things, act, these roadways are actually pretty efficient. This is much more of a materials challenge. So, the opportunity is great I believe the time to act is now. And if we do not heed this clarion call, then many of the things we hold beautiful today and are dear to us will not be in the future. Thank you. Uh, I'll also be around at the coffee clutch thing tomorrow morning as well, but I'll be available after the talk if you're interested. Okay, thank you to all the speakers and thank you for starting to send in questions, keep them coming. And I just wanted to start out with a question for Mario. If you could discuss the similarities and differences between wind turbines and tidal and riverine energy conversion. Okay, well there are many 
differences, but also many similarities. So, um, so one of the things that is amazing, you know, for tidal um, is that density of water is 800 times density of air. So if you think about that, so you need actually a much smaller rotor. So let's say that we have a small wind turbine under the water, you know, to capture, you know, this energy. So the, the, the rotor area is much smaller for the same amount of power. Of course, you know, the, 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 rated, uh, the rated wind velocity and the rated water velocity is different because in one of them is about 12 meters per second, the other one is about 1.5. But when we put all these numbers together, I mean, you end up with having a machine, you know, that uh, instead of, you know, dealing with the, the 45, 50, 60 meters uh, uh, radius for the, you know, classical onshore wind turbines, or even now for the, you know, super big, you know, wind turbines, you know, we are dealing with uh, amazing, very large blades, you know, and uh, much more than that. But for a, a conventional machine, you know, let's say two megawatts, um, we, we go to a very, very small you know, unit for the same amount of power. The other th important thing in, in terms of similarities is that um, if you think about the uh, aerodynamic efficiency that we, we have in a wind turbine, in a good one that is uh, in the range of you know, 48 or 50 percent for the CP, you know, the aerodynamic efficiency, we have exactly the same for these tidal energy converters. And the main reason is that, that although the, the, when you look at the Reynolds number, you know, there, there is an, an, um, a function between you know, the Reynolds numbers and the efficiency. So we are working at the same Reynolds numbers you know, in water than in air. So, so I think these similarities are so great that it doesn't make any sense to have systems so expensive today uh, and is, as I mentioned, you know, was mainly because of operation and maintenance and installation issues, you know, so um, these are probably the differences and the, and the main, you know, uh, things. Thank, yeah. thank you, Mario. I have a question for Lakshana. The, once the polymetallic nodules have been recovered, how do you extract critical metals? Is it similar to processing ores from onshore mines? That's a great question. Um, so there, currently, we're not exactly sure how we're going to uh, process these minerals, uh, these uh, polymetallic nodules. But we think that we can use some of the techniques that exist for, uh, for mineral ores from regular terrestrial mines. Some of the differences are in that um, the ore that we co we recover from the ocean is wet, so that actually poses a very big challenge, and that um, really reduces the TRL level of the technologies that we can use compared to like the land uh, land ores. Um, and another aspect is, you know, do we want to do the post processing of these nodules on the ship itself, or do we want to take them to shore? Because that also poses some uh, differences in how you would approach the, the post-processing. So, so there, there, there are a lot of aspects to consider. And um, currently, you know, we're not exactly sure what the way forward is. Um, but I think it's a really exciting area to, to think about as well going forward. So. Thank you. So for Joe, is it possible to mine landfills for old plastics to convert into fuels? That would be bit, quite difficult simply because of the complexity of what goes on in the churn and the mine, or in the uh, landfills over time. Um, it might be, uh, if you wait a number of years, where only the plastics is left. It might be possible once the food is, waste is gone and all these other things that do degrade rather quickly have decayed. Um, then you might be able to use some kind of float tank or whatnot to, to clean that up and separate it okay. from the dirt. Great. But I hadn't thought much about it. Yeah, thank you. So here's a question for me. What are the ecological impacts of algae harvesting? And maybe I should clarify, when we talk about algal cultivation, in most cases, this is in areas where algae don't grow naturally. The idea is to go further out into the open ocean area, and so you by cultivating it, you create new ecosystem areas where you clearly still have other life, but when the harvest in the harvester design, people are very clearly considering what, that you don't damage or injure any animals. 
And so from an ecological side, it's more an enrichment of an ecosystem because you create more area, even if you harvest it, because a lot of the algae are actually annuals, so they would die at the end of a season anyhow, and that's oftentimes when you harvest. Okay. Uh, so, for Lakshana, is the cobalt content in nodules similar to terrestrial mining? Um, so, it's actually higher in content compared to terrestrial mining, uh, which is why, like, that, that's another reason why, you know, people are starting to look, they're starting to look at deep sea mining because they, they think it's starting to get more economical now, um, because, simply because, you know, there is actually more cobalt content in, in each nodule, so, um, yeah, so, so I guess the, the, the time is ripe, I guess, for, for this kind of mining, so. Okay. I think this one is for Mario. Where should tidal energy generation be sited, and what are the cost implications for the required transmission infrastructure? Well, this is a very good question. Um, the transmission um, in, can be expensive, but I think we, we have to be, um, first of all, you know, we, we can be talking about places that are closer to shore than, you know, let's say floating offshore wind turbines. Um, I think that we need to do a very um, serious analysis about places and, you know, siting because um, we probably don't need to go, you know, very, very far or even very deep. Uh, we can find, you know, very good um, energy content uh, or, or very good places um, in, in areas very close to shore. So this is, this is I think, important. Now, uh, remember that we are also thinking about rivering, and this will be definitely cheaper than that. Um, and on top of that, you know, we have a, a lot of experience now today, you know, from the offshore wind energy, you know, for these connections. Um, so it's, it's definitely an expensive thing, but I think that uh, is something that mm, is in the equation and in the numbers I presented, you know, so um, I think we are okay with that. Okay, great, thank you. Joe. Would it be cheaper to use bioplastics that can be composted instead of designing for recycle? Well, that was sort of what I was implying in the first part of the design for sustainability. I was hoping that people would start doing that. Now, some companies have, in fact, looked at that a little bit, but it's not really hit the mainstream on a large scale. So, I, no, I think that's a perfectly good idea, um, but I'm kind of... <clears throat> annoyed with the definition of recycle as the commercial businesses now refer to it. So it's not what you pick up the curb. It's what you actually convert back into something useful. Okay. So. Okay. Lakshana, who owns the mineral rights at the bottom of the ocean? That's another great question. So, um, so I specifically talked about the clarion Cripperton fracture zone, um, and this area is governed by the law of the seas, so it's the uh, International Seabed Authority who has the, the rights to uh, partition that part of the ocean to different countries. Um, so, uh, so, so, you know, I think this was back in the 60s or 70s, they gave off, like, sort, they, they sort of allowed certain countries to own, I guess, certain parts of that part of the ocean. Um, so, yeah, so it's the International Seabed Authority who makes those decisions. Okay. So, there's a question for me. How does global and ocean climate change impact our ability to grow seaweed? So, there's actually two factors. So, if we are looking at the increase of CO2 in the ocean, that can actually be beneficial for the seaweed that you uh, get a, a faster supply. At the same time, when you make things, the waters warmer, at least certain species don't like very warm temperatures, particularly a lot of the kelps are limited by temperatures oftentimes around 20, 22 degrees Celsius. So one of the things that we are actually observing right now is that the distribution of these kelps are moving further north. So that's definitely one of the challenges that is coming with 
uh, climate change and warming temperatures because a lot of the kelp is actually very productive and we will maybe not be able to grow it in, in all areas. But at the same time, there's a lot of very interesting tropical species. So it's not a complete problem, but it's definitely a shift. So with that, uh, Joe, what is your look on single-use plastic ban and its benefits to programs? Um, well, if that single-use plastic bag can be converted to something else or decomposed uh, in a reasonable length of time, not 400 to 600 years, I don't have much of a problem for it because it has a lot of benefits in terms of the value it could bring. But if it's still going to persist for a long time, then I don't think um, it's something that society should continue to do, personally. Okay. So here's a little bit more technical question. Mario, can you elaborate a little bit more on some of the metric space that you have proposed for floating offshore and now tidal energy converters? Okay, so we have a really little time for, for that right now, right? But, um, so I should say that uh, we are actually looking at the main components in terms of the cost, uh, um, but looking inside the technology. So one, I mean, just to be brief, you know, one of the two things that uh, when you look at the LCOE can be a little bit confusing is that um, the LCOE depends on the site. So you can have places that are very windy or, you know, with very high currents or places that are not so good, right? And this is in the LCOE. And the other thing is the cost of steel. You know, the majority of the components of these wind turbines or tidal energy converters are, you know, made by steel. And the cost of steel, the evolution of that is like crazy. I mean, if, if you look at the plots over the last 10 years, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a crazy, you know, a thing, you know. So one of the things that we try to do is actually to have you know, a metric space that is in the first place independent to these two things. So th this is the reason why we picked this M1 and M2 metrics. And the, so just, you know, as you know, some mm -hmm. char characteristics of that. Um, and then, you know, the other interesting thing is that by playing with that and, and the LCOE curves, you can actually find tasks that you have to do in your company or in your business, you know, to improve this technology. So it's, it's quite easy, you know, to identify, you know, things to do and to put together a plan, you know, to, to go from the current state of the art to north of the LCOE curve. So this is something that is very helpful, you know, for this discussion. So I think this, these main characteristics uh, are, you know, uh, good to, and, and then we have all the equations and everything, by the way. You know, if you're interested in that, you can go and, and look at uh, the RPI website. So you can look at the RPI um, Atlantis program, and there is a definition of these things. Also, our request for information for Tidal, you can find information about that. And we also included a very interesting thing that is an Excel uh, document with all the equations and everything to do the calculations for this new metric space with the Atlantis FOA, you know, so this is also available, you know, so you can play with that. Okay. Thank you. So there's a question about what markets are big enough to absorb all the carbon produced by methane pyrolysis. And just this is really a very good question that we have been struggling with quite a bit. And just for perspective, if we produce one quadrillion BTUs of hydrogen, we at a minimum produce 22.4 million metric tons of carbon. The world market for carbon black, for example, is about 15 million metric tons. So <coughs> there is a very limited number of markets, and probably the, one of the biggest markets is construction materials, concrete. That goes into the billions. And that's really, I think, the largest opportunity space. And actually, we are currently we, out of the Open 2018 cohort, we have selected a team from MIT that is working on the carbon house to look how carbon materials from methane pyrolysis can actually be embedded in construction material and composite building materials. And so 
hopefully we get some answers there, but at the same time, it's something where I would invite people to really think about what can you do with an abundance of carbon. Okay, then we have a question for Joe. What structural economic changes should be developed to support the circular economy with respect to plastics? How can RPE support these? Well, it's a fairly complex and broad question. I think the first one, the design for sustainability, where you deliberately design the use and then the conversion at the same time. So you start with sustainable materials as opposed to starting from petroleum, and then even if you use it as fuel, you're almost net CO2 neutral, but you can recover a lot of the energy too. But that's, RPE should support some of the technologies that right now have not been fully developed in that area, particularly for not just straight um, polymer to fuel, but what are some of those things that you could do to improve the tolerancing for true recycle or conversion. Uh, that second stage I talked about for design for recyclability. That's really quite a huge engineering challenge. It's not, it, it hasn't really been done effectively yet. So I have another question for Mario. Mm -hmm. um, so you have talked about ocean energy, but not really wave energy. Mm -hmm. And so can you talk a little bit what are the opportunities for technology development more in the wave energy space? Is that, and how is that related? Right, so, so first of all, this is a very different animal, you know, so wave energy um, is, is, is much more difficult, you know, to, to, to have, you know, um, economically attractive systems today. Um, we are also interested in that, uh, but uh, you know, I thought you know for this pitch and the, um, even you know for a potential new program, the next step um, ideally is better. You know, the hydrokinetics uh, thinking in tidal and riverine. But anyway, it's a different animal. It's uh, much more expensive. We are maybe talking today about 30 cents or something like that. Um, we have many many devices out there. You know. Um, we have, you know, a amazing projects going on right now at, uh, you know, Sandia Lab and uh, other places, you know, the DOE also put together, you know, a, a, a competition for that, for, waves and, uh, for wave energy converters. So there are, you know, activities going on at DOE as well, you know, for waves um, and, um, but yeah, we are also interested, you know, if you have comments, questions, we are open, you know, for a discussion and maybe this can be another potential program in the future. Okay, thank you. Lakshana, here's a little bit of a different take. Is there an argument for moving away from rare earth metals in energy technology? Sure, I mean, I think if you can develop this technology to do that, that would be great. But, um, but right now, from what I've seen, like, those, like the new types of motors that don't require rare earth elements, like those are still very much at a very low TRL level. And we need to scale up clean energy technologies much faster than those technologies can, uh, can be developed. So, uh, so I think for now, rare earth elements are still, there's, there's still a place for them. And um, uh, I know people are also, you know, outside of rare earth elements, people are also looking at sort of low content of cobalt in, in batteries, um, but it's still very difficult to completely eliminate cobalt. And the more cobalt you, the, the, the less cobalt you use, the more nickel you would need. So then, that, you know, so then nickel becomes more uh, valuable. And um, so I think, I think we should definitely move in that direction, but it's, uh, it, it's a long process, I think. Okay, thank you very much. I think that's the questions that we have had for right now and really appreciate all of you joining us for this session and for all your questions. And I wanted to make sure that you know that we are all available tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock uh, in the Coffee with RPE session. But we are, we showed you the email and don't hesitate to contact us that way. And if you have some burning questions right now, we are going to be standing out here and happy to answer any questions that you might have. But with that, thank you everybody for joining us.